Peter Jennings, thank you for joining us. Over recent months, The Strategist has hosted a debate on the Anglosphere, and you've been a regular contributor to that debate. Just for those viewers who aren't familiar with the term, what exactly is the Anglosphere? Well, there's no dictionary definition, Luke. I, I think you can have broad and narrow definitions. Perhaps the one that's most commonly in use is simply the, the English-speaking countries. Uh, but I think um, I had two meanings that I was wanting really to put forward in my writings on the subject. One was a narrow one about the Five Ice community, Britain, the US, uh, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, which have been particularly effective intelligence and defence partners uh, really since the Second World War now. Um, and my argument there was to say that the Five Eyes community is probably the most effective multilateral military um, relationship working in the world today. Um, almost any uh, military operation that you can think of which requires a community of the willing to assemble in order to enforce norms or to generate stability and you'll find one or more of the five eyes, the anglospheric powers, present and making a, a contribution. Uh, the second sense that I wanted to get across is a broader one which I think some people found um, a little more controversial. And that's the idea that um, the Anglosphere has become something more than simply the English-speaking countries. It's now, I think, a useful shorthand way to refer to countries which are democracies, which um, support the rule of law, which behave according to a variety of international norms of behaviour. In other words, moderate democracies. And I think if you uh, are prepared to take the Anglosphere as a way of describing that, then you have a, a slightly widening number of countries now, which would include places like Japan uh, and a number of the EU countries as well. So by the sounds of it, the Anglosphere is, is no longer about ethnicity, but more about those international norms that the Anglosphere has helped produce and shape over the past century. Or two. Yes, I think that's right. I don't, in fact, I don't think it's really been about ethnicity since the end of the, of the British Empire, really. The term has a, a slightly unfortunate connotation in some respects, and uh, particularly in Australia, I think it's seen to refer to a sort of older style Robert Menzies golden age of British imperialism. Now, really, no one has a use for that type of uh, description anymore uh, in, in the modern world to describe how states organise. But if you use it in the sense that I have, either as that Five Eyes community of military intelligence allies, um, or in terms of a broader community of countries which operate according to the rule of law, I think the phrase still has some contemporary relevance. Right. At the crux of this debate is whether the, the international system, as it stands today, will face a challenge in, in the future. Um, Hugh White has warned that China may well keep getting richer, may keep getting stronger, and may later down the track decide to challenge that international system that is America's leadership of it. Do you think that we should be concerned with China as a threat to the status quo? Well, China is clearly uh, growing and becoming significantly more powerful. And when a country of over a billion people does that, it will challenge the status quo. Really, the, the big question for China is, is, it, is China going to emerge as part of the existing system that we have right now? That is to say, countries which behave according to certain sets of principles in the international community? Or is China going to attempt to chart its own course and not behave according to those type rules and norms of behaviour? Now there's really, there's evidence to suggest that uh, either of those propositions could happen. So for example, we see China prepared to cooperate with a range of countries, Iran, Zimbabwe, um, <clears throat> countries which have really uh, not um, uh, are regarded as pariah states in, by the international community. But China will engage in cooperation to benefit its own economic purposes. On the other hand, we also see a China which is engaged in counter-piracy activities off the Horn of Africa, is now a major contributor to uh, interna international peacekeeping. And so there's perhaps some evidence to say that China is emerging as a norm-following, rule-behaving state, much like uh, the other countries in the international community. Now, which of those two pathways China goes down, I think, is the big question over the next 20 years or so. Sure. Turning to Australia's role in the Anglosphere now, Tony Abbott has spoken in Washington warmly about the Anglosphere. 
Um, do you think that that will form a large part of his foreign policy? In some respects, I think it will. Um, <clears throat> Tony Abbott is, uh, is a conservative in foreign policy terms, and uh, when he was speaking to the Heritage Foundation in Washington uh, some months ago now, he was certainly expressing views about the value of the US alliance to Australia <clears throat> and of the importance of those Anglospheric powers, those five ice countries to Australian interests. Now, I, I can't really argue with that because I do think that the five ice countries form an essential military and intelligence coalition of states which are actually willing to put forces into harm's way in order to preserve the international order. And I have a sense that Tony Abbott will certainly support that and see that as a very core part of his foreign and defence policies. There's a different Abbott, though, which is the one who talks about more Jakarta and less Geneva. Um, and I think there what we will see from Tony Abbott is a strong focus on Australia's nearer region, um, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, the island states of the Pacific, as being countries with which we have to have positive and close relations. And, uh, you know, really Australia is a, a big enough country with a sophisticated enough foreign policy that we should be able to do both of those things uh, without one conflicting against the other. Peter Jennings, thank you. My pleasure.